Hello everybody, this is Professor Lilith. This is the second of a two-part series on the role of sound in Western poetry. And in this case today, what I mean by Western is the literature of the Eastern and Western European languages going back for the last couple of thousand years, although I suspect that a lot of what I have to say here would be similar for uh, Persian, Sanskrit, uh, Turkish, and Arabic as well. Because so much of the Western poetic tradition is a performance and an oral, meaning spoken, but also an aural, meaning heard, tradition, the sound of our poetry is extremely important. It's a major piece of the artistry. Yes, people rhymed poems and had regular meter in order to make it easier to remember, but there's a great deal more to it than that. The use of repetition of sound allows the listener to develop a sense of the pattern of the work that they are listening to. And for us humans, as pattern makers, when we start to hear things that belong together in the same pattern, subconsciously we start to believe that they are connected not just in the way that they sound, but in what they mean. But first, some terminology. So alliteration is the repetition of consonants. Assonance is the repetition of vowels. And rhyme is when you have the repetition of the endings of words where you have two or more words ending in the same vowel and the same consonant in the same order. And sometimes it's multiple vowels and consonants because multiple syllables are rhymed. So examples of alliteration on the, le on the letter K or on the sound K, kitty cat catch skills are typically weak. You know, if you're playing catch with the cats aren't very good at that. Or lilies love listening to liquid lollipops for assonance with some repetition of vowels. We have see the bees eating the treats. That's the letter or the sound E. And will the lackwit not skip this bit is repetition on the short I. And then I have some silly rhymes. Uh, Lily, Billy, Willy, Silly. Bubble, Drubble, Double. And ink, a bink, a bottle of ink. Right. So these should all refresh your memory on some of these basic tools. Let's examine the way that a poet can use sound and pattern to manipulate the meaning of the poem by looking at two 17th century poems that I happen to like a whole lot. So this first one is George Herbert's The Altar. And if you look at it closely, or actually not even very closely, you might notice that this poem, The Altar, is actually the shape of an altar, right? It's got a base, it's got a middle, it's got a top. It's like a little table. And this manipulation of the text on the page is, you know, it's, it's created by the length of the spoken lines in the poem. So it's not an artifact of different typefaces. Each line of the poem is a certain length, and that length creates the image of an altar on the page. And this is an example, actually, of a 17th century taste for giving you the same message in as many different ways as possible which is one of the reasons that this is also an excellent example of the use of uh, rhyme rep and the repetition of sound to create meaning. The entire poem is written in couplets. A couplet is two lines together which both rhyme. So two rhymed lines, one after the other, equals a couplet. And in Western poetry, especially in English language poetry, the couplet is the aural that is the eliciting equivalent of a period. Um, and you'll notice that the whole poem, as I said, is rhymed couplets. If you look at the first couple of rhymes, and when we're analyzing poetry, the, the first word at the, at, the end, at the end of a line is called A, as we're analyzing the rhyme. And then the next word that rhymes with it is also A. Uh, and the first word that doesn't rhyme with it would be B, and so on and so forth. And so in this poem, you see A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E, B, B, F, F, G, G as the rhyme scheme. Now, the fact that this poem is created in a row of couplets 
mirrors the idea of the altar itself because as you read it through, when you listen to it, as you try to read it, um, you'll find that the tendency is to stop at the end of each set of rhymes and that creates a kind of oral equivalent of a slab going into the baking of the altar. And I'm going to read it here so that you get an idea of what I mean by the full stop kind of sound. So, a broken altar lord thy servant rears, made of a heart and cemented with tears, whose parts are as thy hand did frame. No workman's hand hath touched the same. A heart alone is such a stone as nothing but thy power doth cut. Wherefore, each part of my hard heart meets in this frame to praise thy name. That if I share to hold my peace, these stones to praise thee may not cease. Oh, let thy blessed sacrifice be mine, and sanctify this altar to be thine. Now, it's possible to read through some of these lines without stopping. So, for instance, I could do it this way. A broken altar, Lord, thy servant rears, made of a heart and cemented with tears, whose parts are as thy hand did frame, no workman's hand hath touched the same. But you actually run out of breath, and it doesn't quite sound right. Even when you get to the short lines, a heart alone as such a stone, as nothing but thy power doth cut, it's easy to say it all the way through without breathing, but the tendency to stop is very strong. For me to try to read it with no pause at all is actually pretty difficult. Let me try that again. I'll take another run at it. A heart alone is such a stone as nothing but thy power doth cut. And I just really can't make myself not stop for the second part of it. Um, so by making all of these little couplets, Herbert has created a sense of stacking of the uh, elements of the altar. I imagine it as a, bunch of uh, as a bunch of slabs stacked one on top of another, the way that the couplets are. And this, of course, um, does a great job of giving you the message of the poem as a whole, because the poem is about the speaker raising up their heart as an altar, an altar which was actually built by God, not by any human being. And so the poem is about the building of the altar itself and how it's broken and how it has to, and how only God can make it. Um, and the actual speaking of the words of the poem creates a little bit of a sense of the process of building in and of itself. Now let's listen to the way using a different rhyme pattern creates a different mood and feeling in a poem. And here we have George Herbert's Easter Wings, another one of his poems that is created in such a way that just its appearance on the page and its sound in your ear reflects what it's talking about. You have to turn it 90 degrees, but I'm sure that you can see the bird flapping its wings in this poem. And here, the rhyme scheme is not A, B, it's not A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. It's A, B, A, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, A, B, A, B, A, C, D, C, D, C. Now, there's a couple of ones that may look to you like they are not actually rhymes. So, for instance, you'll see that he rhymes rise and victories. And that actually tells you more about 17th century English than it does about rhyming, right? Presumably when Herbert spoke those words, they still rhymed. Now you find later on that 19th century poets continue to rhyme words that don't rhyme in modern English, but that's a whole different uh, poetry lecture and beyond my skill level. So anyway, let's talk about George Herbert's Easter Wings and how that choice of rhyme scheme impacts it. First, Look at the length of the lines. You'll notice that the very shortest lines are the ones that say most poor in the first stanza and most thin in the second stanza. And then the line immediately after these very short ones that builds up into larger and larger lines is with thee. And it's with thee in both cases. So as the poet is joining with thee, who in this case is God, uh, the blinds get longer and longer. So let's read it a little bit here. 
Lord who created to man and wealth and store, till foolishly he lost the same, decaying more and more, till he became most poor. And there's the natural pause. One wants to say that whole line on its own, really. With thee, O oh, let me rise as larks harmoniously, and sing this day thy victory, and then shall the fall further the flight in me. Notice the alliteration in that last line, and it's the only line in that section that has lots of alliteration. And you'll see that the last line of the second stanza also has a lot of alliteration, and it's the same alliteration. It's F and L in both cases. So then we have, My tender age in sorrow did begin, and still with sicknesses and sin thou didst so punish. I'm sorry. Uh, My tender age in sorrow did begin, and still with sicknesses and shame thou didst so punish sin that I became most thin. With thee let me combine and feel thy victories. For if I imp my wing on thine, affliction shall advance the flight in me. When we read through these, the tendency of having the rhyme spread out is for your voice to keep searching. You're, as you're hearing the pattern, your ear is waiting to hear the rhyme. We've established by the end of the third line of the poem, Lord, who expectest Lord, who created man and wealth at store, though foolishly he lost the same, decaying more and more. As soon as we hear that more and more, we know that it's going to be rhyming. And we are listening for the rhyme to be. Where is it going to come in? Where is the rhyme for same? When we hear that rhyme for A, we, and we know that there is going to be rhyming, we're expecting it. And so having the rhymes spread out causes the ear and the subconscious of the listener to continue to move forward. This poem is a little bit unusual in Western poems, especially Western poems of the 17th century, in that it does not end with a couplet. But of course it doesn't end with a couplet. It doesn't have a closed rhyme scheme at the end. It wants you to continue to rise mentally with the soul. Right? For if I imp my wing on thine, which means actually if I rest my wing on thighs on thine, affliction shall advance the flight in me. If we're talking about flight, we don't want to end with a couplet because we are taking off. Right? Next, we're going to look briefly at the most famous example of the use of rhyme alliteration to assonance in English to create meaning where there actually isn't very much in a poem. This is Lewis Carroll's short poem, Jabberwocky, that was actually inserted into part of Through the Looking Glass. I've marked not just the rhyme scheme on the right, but I've also marked where there are internal rhymes with end lines. And with underlines, I've marked where we have alliteration and assonance employed. Most of the most important words in this are Nonsense. Brillig, Slithy, Geyer, Gimble, Mimsy, Borogroves, Momrats, Outgrabe, Jabberwock, Jubjub, Frumius, Bandersnatch, Vorpal, Vaxome, Tuntum, Uffish, Whiff, no, Whiffling is a real world, Wood, Tulgy, but not Burbled, not Vorpal, not Sticker Snack, not Golumphing, Beamish, Frabjus, Kalu, Kalay, None of those words existed in English when they were written. Some of them have actually become part of the language since then. But nevertheless, if you read this poem out loud to yourself or listen to somebody else read it, you'll understand what happened, kind of. And the reason that you do that is the way he has used rhyme, alliteration, and assonance to make a connection in your subconscious brain. That and the use of these peculiar words in a context where sometimes you can guess their meaning just because of what's going on around them. I do encourage you to read this poem on your own. But for now, let's sum up what we learned about rhyme, alliteration, and assonance. To sum up, our brains try to make meaningful connections whenever we hear similarities in sound. Rhymes that are close together, couplets, for example, create an impression of a thought coming to an end. 
when they are further apart, rhymes create an impression of motion forward. Alliteration and accents create, a, create a more subtle but also important oral connection. And those three tools together, well, with all of these tools at his disposal or her disposal, the poet can change a poem's pace, they can indicate connections in thought or breaks in thought, and these do not have to be related to the meanings of the words that they're using at the same time. So it gives them an additional tool to work with. So if you've watched both of these videos on sound and poetry, I hope that now you have a better understanding of why it is that poets rely on rhyme, alliteration, assonance, and meter. Not just to make the poem sound cool, although that, that in, its, in and of itself is a good reason to use these tools, but also because it gives poets a number of additional ways to convey meaning beyond the actual words of the poem itself. Bye!